Wednesday, Monday. I got it way too ahead of myself. Monday, rocking and rolling, new week, fresh and I'm out of short in the streets, talking Bama football news. In my own words, yours truly, Stephen Smith here of TDA Crimson Tide. Looks like it has regained that toughness identity. Good win there over Ole Miss of the weekend, 30 to 24. Tide got win number eight of the season in Oxford. We're bringing you the show from the magic city of Birmingham. Driven this to you on YouTube. Speaking of the channel, you know what time it is. Go ahead and hit that like button right now. Give us that thumbs up. Give a like on the show. Uh, trying to get this thing to 50 likes right now to set us off. Appreciate all the support coming from you, the Bama fans. Hit that subscribe button also. Get every family member, every friend, every diehard fan, a casual fan, consumer of Bama football too. Hit that subscribe button. Turn all of those notifications on. Hit that little bell so that way you miss nothing on your favorite program. Also, daily Super Chat Go $100. Daily Super Chat Go $100 right there. Appreciate the support from you. All donations appreciate it. And welcome to as Jimmy Cash Clay drops in $25 here in the Super Chat Show and Love Dancing Steven there. Appreciating that right there. So thanks to Jimmy Clay for getting us fired up here on the show. And got a good one today. Got a real good one today. And we want to hear from you, the Bama faithful. You can do this by calling 205 448 1358. I'm going to call in. Let your voice be heard. 205 448 1358. One more time. 205 448 1358. Appreciate all of you guys checking us out here on today's show. And uh, we're going to get into topic number one here of the conversation, Eli. And this one being on, uh, you know, Alabama got the 30-24 to victory over Ole Miss. Now, the first half, it looked like, here we go again. Alabama going for the motions, playing uninspired, playing like, does it really want to be in this matchup? getting pushed around. Uh, uh, the Rebels brought the physicality to the Crimson Tide in its run game and, and uh, in its passing attack as well. But something happened. You know, Nick Saban and Bryce Young uh, spoke to the team on, on the sideline. We all kind of know what Nick Saban may have said to the team. But what did Bryce Young tell those guys? Because something happened in that second half. A switch flipped up. And Alabama started to play with more toughness, with more physicality, with that competitive fire, that competitive mindset, and uh, changed the whole course of the game uh, in uh, the second half to get the six-point victory and its eighth win of the season. Uh, and that provides the question, you know, is Alabama back to that old-school toughness? I understand one game against Ole Miss, you still have – Austin P. this week, Auburn next week in the Iron Bowl, but of course, whatever postseason game, bowl game that Alabama would have on the schedule. But did this show any indication of old school toughness here returning for Bama? And uh, case in point, you look at Byron Young and Jace McClellan. Boy, did they bring it. On their individual sides of the football, Byron Young, uh, a native of Mississippi, from Laurel, Mississippi, former four-star in the 2019 class, he spoke highly inspired last week. He talked about, we still have a lot to play for. We're playing for the script A on our jersey, on our chest. We're playing for the name on the back of a jersey. We're playing for... Our teammates, our brothers around us, we're playing for the pride of a program. There's still a lot on the line here. And not only did Byron speak this, he played like that against the big-time team of his home state. Young, 11 tackles, shared a team lead, two tackles for loss, two sacks, was all over Jackson Dart, uh, the quarterback there for the Rebels. Uh, Young, uh, one quarterback hurry, one forced fumble, and also a uh, pass breakup as well. Byron Young getting numerous individual awards this week. He deserved them. I mean, a, a guy that really carried 
of his defense. I'm going to fire, set the tone, uh, had everybody playing together as one. Uh, big performance there from Byron Young. Uh, and I think, to me, made himself some draft money. Made himself some draft capital for that performance because several scouts were at the game, Eli. Of course, you and I both were there. The Detroit Lions were at the game. Uh, I think the Arizona Cardinals were there. The Rams were there. The Saints were there. The Jets were there. I think I counted maybe eight or nine teams that were at the game. And, and of course, the Reese's Senior Bowl, uh, Jim Nagy had his staff there as well. So uh, Byron Young played big, played nasty, played like a man on a mission. Coach Saban talked about it. He's a Mississippi guy. He was fired up for this game uh, and did his job out there on the field. But equally as important as Byron Young, uh, Jace McClellan. Oh, what a game he had. 19 carries, 84 yards, led the team rushing. Averaged nearly five yards per rush. Had some plays in the second half where he just would not be denied. Running through guys, powering through guys. Showing the brute strength and physicality. Even sparked the offensive line. Like, McClellan had some runs that had uh, J.C. Latham and Emil Ekior going, Ooh, wee! We got to help our boy out here. We got to get some pancake blocks, some kickout blocks. We got to lay some guys on the ground. You know, help Jace out as he's running this hard. I mean, I understand we all appreciate the explosive playmaking ability that is Jameer Gibbs, absolutely. But when Gibbs got hurt during the game, twisted ankle, and McClellan went out there, boy, did he supply a power. But Alabama needs, and Alabama was lacking for a good bit this season. And what he also did, McClellan showed Bill O'Brien, do you see what happens when you trust the run game? Do you see what happens when you lean on the backs? Do you see what happens when you give the run game an opportunity? Success happens. Positive things happen. And I believe moving forward, you got to get McClellan more opportunities. He's played well all year. Enjoyed uh, the most attempts he's had all season. 19 there against Ole Miss. So, uh, Byron Young, uh, Jace McClellan, that in the tone there in the matchup against Ole Miss. And, uh, you know, Saban mentioned after the game, you know, we, we took a step in the right direction. No, Bama went through some adversity, didn't come out the way it wanted to, but got things corrected, changed some things up, competed like crazy, and took a step in the right direction. We saw the toughness. We saw the meanness. We saw the physicality. We saw some shades of old Alabama football. So what does this mean? Can Alabama take this? To the last two games of the regular season, playing like this against Austin P, playing like this against Auburn, take the second half of the Ole Miss game and put a full game together against those two teams, and then take it also into postseason play. Whether you get a New Year's Six Bowl or whatever bowl you get, and playing like you played the second half against Ole Miss as well, we'll see. Well, we saw toughness in the second half. We saw physicality. We saw two guys in Byron Young and Jace McClellan lead the team, offensively and defensively. Nick Saban after the game. Huh. We took a step in the right direction as a football team. See how it goes off from here. We take our first break on the show. Don't touch that Dow. Just getting started upon our return. We go to the phone lines, let us up. We grab your calls, your thoughts, your conversations and dialogue. Let your voice be made known right after this. Nine players have teamed up and released the Alabama Team Paper, which is a video yearbook they put out for sale direct to fans. 
Now, for the first time, small dollar purchases from the fans can support the players as a group as well as a great cause because one dollar of every subscription payment is donated to the Boys and Girls Club of America. Be a five-star fan base and support your team and a great cause with Team Paper. Check it out at teampaper.com slash Alabama. Remember the taste of Grandma's delicious sweets? Emily's Heirloom Pound Cakes brings back those precious memories with just one bite. Each cake made from scratch. They make the perfect dessert to share with family and friends for any occasion, and ordering is easy. Visit Emily's Heirloom Pound Cakes.com. Click the online store and shop. Then pick up your fresh cake at the kitchen in downtown Homewood. Order yours online at Emily's Heirloom Pound Cakes.com. Emily's Heirloom Pound Cakes, making memories from scratch. All right, folks, we're back into the action from the break on a Monday. Getting that work week started off for you correctly. Crimson Tide taking on Austin P this weekend on Saturday at Bryant Denny. Game 11 a.m. Central Time. Also, the Iron Bowl, the time in the network has been announced for that one. CBS will have the Alabama Auburn game on Saturday, November 26, 2 30 p.m. Central Time kickoff for that one. Continue hitting the like button, drop a like on the show, give us that thumbs up, trying to get this thing to 50 likes right now. Appreciate you guys also. All donations welcome and appreciated. That, that daily super chat go $100 daily super chat go right there. Appreciate the love from you guys. Brian Watson with that one ninety nine in the super chat showing love there. Appreciate Brian uh, Watson there for that support. We go to the phone lines to grab your calls. The call segment brought to you by the Blue Wrench Gang, 205-448-1358. I'm going to call in 205-448-1358. We grab this call. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feeling? State your name and where you calling from. Live on the show, caller. Just may have missed that call right there. Continue, though. Get your thoughts in, 205-448-1358. And I'm going to call in to let your voice be heard, 205-448-1358. Do we have him now, Eli? Well, we, 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 don't, we, we don't have that call yet. But like I said, continue to get your thoughts in, your calls into the show. But as you guys are getting everything set and prepared together, Eli, just, just re- recapping there that first topic. You and I were both in Oxford for the game. Uh, we did see some old school toughness from Alabama. We did. Guys came out, you know, slightly going through the motions there. You know, you wonder, would this be another game where Alabama looks uninspired and the opposition would slip up on it, get a victory over it, but we don't know what Bryce Young said on the side. Or whatever he said, it worked, it took root, guys took it in and uh, that second half Ole Miss was held to 7 points 166 yards offensively one third down conversion Jackson Dart was under pressure all the part of the second half Alabama's offense started to get things going in the run game uh, and you get a 6 point win 30 to 24 you know giving you your, giving you the 8th win of the year Alabama trying to finish the season strong and end the regular season at 10 and 2. But we grab this call. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feeling? State your name and where you calling from. You're live on the show, caller. Well, unfortunately, did not get that call either. You guys continue to... Get into the phone lines here, 205-448-1358. The number two, let your voice be made known right here, uh, 205-448-1358, talking Bama football. We're going to go here to a cool call topic here, Eli, as uh, Byron Young and uh, Will Reichert both earning SEC Player of the Week honors for their efforts against Ole Miss. Will Reichert, SEC Special Teams Player of the Week. Byron Young, SEC co-defensive lineman for the week. We've spoken with Byron Young did, but uh, Will Riker made three field goals in 
the matchup, scored 12 points, made all of his extra points. One of the field goals he made was a 49-yarder. He also executed two touchbacks on seven kickoffs, so big ups to the Riker. Uh, as far as Byron Young, along with being the SEC co-defensive lineman of the week, he made the Reese's Senior Bowl player of the week as well. And uh, Young was one of several names uh, that Jim Nagy, the executive director for the Reese's Senior Bowl, and his staff, was. he had Young on uh, that Senior Bowl watch list. So Byron Young uh, doing his thing there against Ole Miss, both Young and Riker getting those weekly honors there. But we're going to go to a break here, folks. Don't touch that dial because when we return to the action, we're going to dive into uh, has Alabama found its number one wide receiver? Has Nick Saban identified the primary go-to guy for the Tide? It appears he did it in today's presser. We'll talk about it after this. Touchdown Alabama Magazine is Alabama football's premier publication. A subscription to Touchdown Alabama Magazine is the perfect gift for any Alabama fan. For exclusive news and information, recruiting updates, a free annual print magazine, and more, go to touchdownalabama.com and click join. Only $7.95 per month or pay $74.95 for a full year subscription. That's a yearly saving of $20. Go to touchdownalabama.com today and roll tide. And we're back into the action here, folks. Rocking and rolling in from the break. Yours truly, Stephen M. Smith, in uh, my own words for TDA. Gotta got always keep my eyes on you guys in the chat line. Appreciate all that you do in the YouTube chat line, all of your thoughts, all of your conversations, all the comments, the love that you show us right here on the show. We have made it to 50 likes on the show. Now we're trying to get this thing up to 75, so continue hitting that like button, dropping a like on the show, giving us that thumbs up, making this your platform and place to talk Bama football. Also, all donations welcomed and appreciated. That daily super chat go $100. Daily super chat go $100 right there. Appreciate the love from you guys. But, you know, we're going to get in here to uh, this conversation. That is, uh, you know, has Alabama found the number one receiver, the go-to guy? Has Nick Saban identified that guy? And I know this season it has not been uh, a fruitful year for the receiver corp, especially when you talk, you know, last year having the success that Jamison Williams put up and John Mechie put up, and people like to rag on Slade Bolden, but he served a purpose also. You know, in years past, Alabama's always had that one guy you can go to the well to, whether it was Julio Jones, Amari Cooper, Calvin Ridley, Jerry Judy, Devontae Smith, Henry Ruggs, Jalen Waddle. There's always been that guy. Alabama doesn't necessarily have that guy this year. However, Saban mentioned something in today's press conference where he highlighted sophomore Ja'Cory Brooks from South Florida. 6'2", 196-pounder. What did he say? He said, Ja'Cory has played extremely well for us. The guy's a dog. The guy's a flat-out dog. He plays on special teams, uh, really physical, makes contested catches, does everything he can to help the team win. I'm sure he will tell you some things that he needs to improve on, but he's the most consistent guy we've had all season. That's Nick Saban on Ja'Cory Brooks. And uh, it got me thinking, you know, Saban used the same word. He, he's a dog to describe Jamison Williams last year. And J-Mo came in as a transfer from Ohio State, 79 catches, 1,572 yards, 15 touchdowns, became a first-round pick in this year's draft, number 12 overall to to the Detroit Lions. The guy, in in terms of single-season marks for Alabama, his 79 catches, I believe third single-season history, his 1,572 yards, fifth in single-season history, and his 15 touchdowns, I mean third in single-season history. So j did work, and Nick Saban referred to him as a dog, wanted it to be, wanted to do everything to help the team win, put him anywhere on the field. 
loved playing special teams also. So it's kind of interesting that the same word used to describe JMO is being put here for Ja'Cory Brooks. And uh, we've seen C7 make big plays. I mean, last year, the Iron Bowl, when uh, JMO ejected from the game for targeting, Nick Saban, the team needed somebody to step up. Who did it? Freshman Ja'Cory Brooks, 28-yard game-tying touchdown in the matchup with Auburn to cap off a 12-play, 97-yard drive, a minute, 20 second, 27 seconds to go on the clock. Bama ties the game at, at, uh, at 10, going into the four overtimes that happened before the tie pulled it out 24-22. And then the Goodyear Cotton Bowl, where Brooks' 44-yard touchdown reception from Bryce Young against the Cincinnati Bearcats. So we've seen a C7 make plays throughout his young career so far. But uh, for Nick Saban to refer to him as the dog, as the competitor, as the guy that's been the most consistent, the question is, does Bryce Young now go more to Brooks in the passing game? And I'm not saying to force feed Brooks. No, you you don't want to force feed him. We saw this with Blake Sims and Amari Cooper in 2014. As good as that combination was, there were times Blake would try to force feed Amari Cooper, and that just unfortunately did not work. And then 2016, uh, we all remember Jalen Hurts trying to force feed Calvin Ridley, and that did not work either. So I'm not saying for Bryce Young to force feed Brooks, but should he look in his direction a bit more? Because, uh, I mean, Jermaine Burton has not had the season we all, and I myself included, thought he would have coming over from Georgia. Trayshawn Holden has not had the season we all kind of thought he would have. Uh, Alabama, not, I mean, JoJo Earl is playing a bit more now since coming back from the injury. I'm, um, we haven't seen a whole lot of Tyler Harrell transfer from Louisville, although Coach Saban mentioned, hey, he's healthy, he's good, he's getting more comfortable, getting more reps. We just haven't seen much of Tyler Harrell at all. And then Christian Leary, I'm still mind-boggled by why is he not on the field with the speed that he has, the ability to take the top off a of defense that he possesses and brings, but... Corey Brooks here, because of his consistency in the last four, you know, SEC games, he's played well. Played well against, uh, he played well against uh, Mississippi State, played well against Tennessee, played well against uh, LSU, and then played well against Ole Miss. So the last four games, he's played well. In three of the four games, he's caught at least one touchdown pass. So he's been active, he's been consistent, he's been effective. It's just, if you're Bryce Young, do you look more toward his side? Do you look more so his way just due to the ultimate compliment that Nick Saban gave the young wide receiver? But it's interesting. Very interesting. The Nick Saban showered that love there on one Ja'Cory Brooks. So we shall see you know, how he performs against Austin P. We'll see how he performs against Auburn. Because if, if you look at next season, you know, he's a guy that is going to be counted on you know, even more, especially depending on who decides to go to the NFL draft after the season at the receiver position. Now, honestly, I don't think nobody I, – I, honestly, nobody should be going to the draft. <laughs> I mean, Jermaine Burton has, a, has not had the year where he can go over draft. Trayshawn Holden has not had the year where he can go over draft. Tyler Harrell certainly has not had the season for him to go over the draft. So nobody should be putting their name in the draft hat point blank, period. But Corey Brooks, just definitely keep your eyes on him as a guy that next season will be called upon even more you know, as that leader in the receiver room. But take another break here, folks, from the show and touch that down. When we get back, we return to... The phone lines, we grab your calls, your thoughts, your conversations. We grab more of uh, your your topics. What's on your mind right after this? Every sports 
fan deserves the proper representation. Wit Will Sports introduces to you the title towel. Wave that title towel in the air like you just don't care in support of Nick Saban and the Alabama Crimson Tide. Only $9.99 and it lasts a lifetime. Head on over to WitWillSports.com and get your title towel today. Touchdown Alabama Magazine is Alabama football's premier publication. A subscription to Touchdown Alabama Magazine is the perfect gift for any Alabama fan. For exclusive news and information, recruiting updates, a free annual print magazine, and more, go to touchdownalabama.com and click join. Only $7.95 per month or pay $74.95 for a full year subscription. That's a yearly saving of $20. Go to touchdownalabama.com today and roll tide. All right, folks, we're rocking and rolling in here to the action from the break. Hottest show on the streets talking Bama football news. In my own words, yours truly, Stephen Smith of TDA. Got the man Eli Walker in the production studio. And, uh, folks, as always, hit that thumbs up. Give us a like on the show. Hit that like button. Make this your show, your network, platform, channel, space to talk tight football. Also, that daily super chat go $100.00. Daily Super Chat Go. Appreciate the love and support from all of you. All donations welcomed and appreciated. But now we go to the phone lines to grab your calls. The call segment brought to you by the Blue Wrench Gang, 205 448 1358. Number to call in 205 448 1358. That's the number right there. We grab this call. You're live on the show. What's going on? How we feeling? State your name and where you calling from? Hey, Steve, this is Michael from Columbus, South Carolina. How you doing? Doing great, Michael, and yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I know it's been a while since I've been on the podcast. And, you know, I'll be honest, Stephen, um, the, the loss against against LSU, um, it really, uh, it really kind of, I really had to take some time and kind of, you know, see what, you know, what was going on with the team. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm not going to come on the podcast. I'm going to come on the week after and kind of talk about. But I really love how we played against Ole Miss Saturday. And I do, I really believe that we have found our right receiver in Jacoby Brooks. And to me, he should have been starting um, in the beginning of the season. I mean, I know you, I, they went, I mean, I know Saban went to go with Christian Holden and Jermaine Burton. But to me, Jacoby Brooks, I mean, he's been that that receiver that you can you can depend on, and you got Kobe Prentice and Isaiah Bond that's behind. I can also, I mean, that 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 that's also been playing really good. So, I got a couple questions for you, Stephen. Now, um, do you believe that uh, there's a chance that that Alabama could still make it to the playoffs? It's it's very it's it, it's very slim, Michael. But I I don't see it. I mean I, I I don't see it at this point. You would have to have a whole bunch of chaos happen among the top you no know, four teams. But I, I don't see it uh, at this point. Saban and Alabama are playing for the rest of this season, regular season, and you know New Year's Six Bowl is there. A New Year's Six Bowl shot is still there. But as far as the playoff, very slim. But I I, I just don't see it. Yeah, that's why I was um I've been hearing them all talk about it on the uh, on, on um, Sports Center and they've been talking a lot about you know everything Alabama can get in. I'm like, well, you know, yeah, I mean, a, a, I haven't seen a six and two team ever you know get into the playoffs. Um, now it's also, I mean, it, again, it would take a lot of the top teams, including Ohio State and Michigan and and and, and, and Georgia, TCU would take pretty much those teams to kind of to lose a game or two for that to happen. But, yeah, that, I mean, that's really why I wanted to know, you know, you know, was there a possibility. But looking forward to the um, the last two games, um, Austin, Austin Pay and, and Auburn. Um, how do you see uh, – do you believe that there's a chance against the, the game we have this Saturday, there's a chance that we will get to see some of the guys that probably haven't played a lot um, come in, like Tyler Harrell, um, Shaz Preston, maybe see some of those guys. Maybe see some of those other guys on on, on defense. Um, you know, like um, uh, like um, um, like Keenan, like Keanu, um, Keanu, and 
uh, Jahat Campbell and some of those guys? Will we get to see some of the new guys I'm playing in Dawson B? I think so. Uh, Michael, I think so. I know Saban, a lot of times, there's a lot to talk about. No young guys playing in these matchups, but you you have to get the young guys on the field because Austin Page you just do too. Uh, you got to get them some reps for the future. You got to get them some reps and some and some confidence going into next spring and ultimately next season, especially with the guys that Batai could lose to the NFL draft, both on offense and defense. So you have to have the Jeremiah Alexanders, the Jihad Campbells, the Tyler Harrells, the uh, the 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 uh, the Shaz Prestons, the Kendrick Laws, you got to get them on the field and in big action for this matchup. Even down to, you know, Ty Simpson and, and Jalen Milrow, you know, getting them out, getting both of those two out there on the field in terms of quarterback play against Austin Page to set up you know, the quarterback competition for next spring and next season. So the young guys, they've got to play this week. And then lastly, Steve, I know this is going to be a probably tough question to answer. Um, last, uh, the last time I was on the podcast, you know, me and you were talking about our predictions of who we think was going to win the uh, Tennessee Georgia game, and you said it was too. You couldn't, I uh, couldn't, you know, choose which team, and I was the same way. Like I, I, I can't really choose. And then watching the game between Georgia and Tennessee, and seeing Georgia, I mean, just, I mean. Like I said, Tennessee, to me, it, it really caught me a surprise that they lost that game. Um, but it kind of really showed that Georgia, I mean, I mean, Georgia, to me, seems like maybe the best, maybe one of the best teams right now. But I'm going to give you, I'm going to ask you another tough, tough one. Who do you see winning the national championship? Who do I, who do I see winning the national championship? That's a good question. Georgia. Georgia's who I see winning it. I mean, uh, Kirby Smart. I mean, the guy has this defense playing unreal after all that was lost to the NFL draft. And Georgia lost Georgia lost some men. They lost some men. Jordan Davis is a grown man. Quay Walker, a grown man. Nicobe Dean, a grown man. Trayvon Walker, a grown man. Georgia lost some men to the draft. And the way Kirby was still able to retool in terms of recruiting, uh, restock up on guys in terms of recruiting, and have this team uh, right as good as it was last year, maybe even better in spots than what it was last year, and how strong Stetson Bennett continues to play, and that team just feeds off that defense with Kirby, uh, Glenn Schumann, and Will Muschamp. I-, I would have to go Georgia. Well, I really do believe that this, it's going to be very exciting to see what happens. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with Ohio State. I just I I'm look, I've been watching some of their games um, for the last two weeks. The game against Northwestern and the, their game against uh, against Indiana last week. And I'm telling you, Marvin Harrison Jr. I, I don't know how you cover him. He may be the best wide receiver in the nation. I just don't know how you cover him up. I mean, I'm seeing him making ridiculous plays that I'm just like it's just unreal. Um, and their defense, to me, I mean, they have a really good defense as well. I mean, so I, I, I'm hoping that it comes down to Georgia and Ohio State. I mean, TCU, TCU and Michigan, they got good teams. But to me, when you really look at it, I, I just think it, 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 they're shutting up for Ohio State and, and Georgia in, in, in the national championship. What do you think about season? I mean, Georgia, Ohio State National Championship, Mike, would be fun to watch. You would have two really good teams. You have you would have you have an explosive, you know, offense in Ohio State with a Heisman front runner and CJ Stroud, uh, but could it move the ball against an unstoppable uh defense, uh, unmovable defense like Georgia's headlined by you know a defensive mind and Kirby Smart would be a fun one. Appreciate my man Michael there calling from South Carolina into the show right here in my own words. Yours truly, Stephen M. Smith. We grab this call. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feeling? State your name and where you calling from. Roll, tight, roll, Stephen M. What's happening, my friend? Doing great, William. Can I complain here? I mean, we, we saw Alabama. You know, some some old school toughness. Second half against Ole Miss. Uh, Saban mentioning, hey, we, we, we took a step in the right direction uh, and becoming the football team that we want to be. So now it's, okay, you have two more games left from the regular season slate here. Can you take the second half of Ole Miss 
and apply it a full game against Austin Pay this week and Auburn next week? Yes, sir. I, I watch that game. I, I, I love a, a win any time, any day, man, any, any Saturday. Uh, I, I'll, I'll try to keep it quick, man. I, uh, so uh, uh, did you happen to see, I believe it was yesterday, the news that, uh, you know, when we had our national championship last, it was where? Up in Indianapolis? Yes. Did, did you see the news about where the the company, the turf company, is uh, having lawsuits now because the, there's something wrong? And, that, and you know, that's where Jamison Williams got hurt. Okay. Now, turf. Did now, you hear I about did, that? Now, I, now, now, I did not hear that part of it. Yeah, there's ten. There's ten NFL fields that that are that they're recalling because of the turf. Something wrong with it. So, you know, if I was Jamison Williams, I'd be checking into that. You know, because he he might could get him some extra money for that, especially if, since he got injured up there. Absolutely. S- something definitely. If I was J-Mo, I would be looking into William. I mean, absolutely. Because uh, you th- think about this. Jameson Williams doesn't go down with that injury. We're looking at, you know, Alabama finishing last season as a national champion. So that is something. That if I was Jameson Williams right now, and I know he's scheduled to play his first game for the Lions, I believe even this month or, or to start December. But if I was J-Mo, that would be something to look into. Yes, sir. Anyway, roll tide. Looking forward to uh, to uh, beating uh, Austin P. Now, what time is that going to be? That will have- be that will be William eleven a.m. So people that are not that are not loving to get up early, you got to get up early. Eleven a.m. kickoff. I can do that. Yes, sir. I'll have my I have my moonshine ready to go. Roll tide, brother. Appreciate William from Iowa calling in right there to the show. And that's interesting there, Eli, that they're having callbacks there on 11 NFL fields because of that turf. I always, I always knew turf, it doesn't give or, or, or doesn't hold well, and it gives too quick. And when it gives too quick and you can't cut, you have these knee and ankle and foot type injuries. So if I was J-Mo... That's definitely something to look into right there. We take this call now. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feeling? State your name and where you calling from? My name is Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm from South Nigeria. Appreciate Jeffrey calling in from, from South Nigeria. We, we, we're touching the whole globe here, Eli. We got international callers here. Appreciate Jeffrey with that call there. Uh, we take this call here. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feeling? State your name and where you calling from. What's going on, Steve, my man? This is Elijah from Jersey. How you feeling? Doing great, Elijah, and yourself? Oh, man, I'm hanging in there. Uh, I just basically called to see, you know, get your thoughts on uh, what bright spots uh, did you see in the game this weekend? Because you know, I didn't, I didn't catch the game this weekend. I got kind of frustrated and tired of, you know, my thing with this team this year, Steve. You know, every every Alabama team, you see them grow, and uh, this team this year, they kind of make the same mistake, mistakes as they did the first game of the season. I haven't seen them really grow as a team this year. And it kind of frustrates me, Steve. It's not about the wins and losses. You know what I mean? Because, um, hell, Alabama, when he lost to LSU in that in that nail-biter game, what, 12-9 to 9 or something like that, they lost that year. You know, a loss is a loss, but it's just the way they played, the way they executed, the emotion that they played with. You know, I can I could deal with the – a tough, hard-fought loss. Both teams is battling out. Y'all both disciplined. Uh, somebody got to win and somebody got to lose. I-, I can deal with that, Steve. But when you start seeing the way we play and the effort, the lack of execution, and we in the week eight, we in the week nine, we in the week seven, you know, it, this just don't feel like Alabama football. So I, I kind of given up on watching it even though I will be attending the uh, the Iron Bowl game because 
my fiance got me tickets for my birthday. But, you know, me watching this team this year, Steve, I kind of tossed it up in the air. So basically I'm calling to see what bright spots did you see in this game this week, if any, um, that it looked like th- this team improved on certain aspects of of the game. Well, one well one, one of the few bright spots Elijah I did see was the play of Byron Young uh, at defend on the defensive on the defensive line at defensive end. And Young has always had the talent; he's always been productive. But th- this was the one game where he really truly took over, and uh, he had the type of game over the weekend that you thought Will Anderson would have. But it was Byron Young and uh, the moves he was putting on guys, whether it was with his hands uh, or with his quickness, getting inside, pressuring Jackson Dart, uh, getting in there after the run game, uh, uh, Byron Young really showed out. And then uh, I think number two, uh, Chase McClellan. I understand uh, we highlight Jameer Gibbs, the season he's had, and he's had a good year. But Chase McClellan showed me the power, the strength, uh, the determination, he was bouncing off tackles. He had several effort-type plays. And I'm like, okay, this is what Alabama needed to have um, from the start of the season. We're just now getting it. But this is what Alabama should have been at the start of the year. So saw some good things from McClellan, some great things from Byron Young. Uh, seeing some things from uh, Ja'Cory Brooks that finally he's starting to kind of showcase himself as maybe – you know, he's the number one receiver, as he should be. I know people look at, well, Jermaine Burton came in from Georgia, but Jermaine Burton should have stayed at Georgia. He's had a, he has not had that year. He's, he's not been that guy. Not been that guy, period. Uh, Trey Sean Holden has not been that guy. It should have been uh, uh, Ja'Cory Brooks and the freshman from day one, or Ja'Cory Brooks, Christian Leary, JoJo Earl, and the freshman from day one. But the, the fact that you know people are – Say, but as far as starting to look at, we got to get Brooks more of the ball kind of late in the season to feel that way, but you're seeing the competitor that, that he is. So that there were a few bright spots, not too many. I thought the one big thing was uh, some physical toughness that was shown in the second half. It's about time because the first half, it looked like Bama was going for the motions again for like the second, for like the third, fourth week in a, war, in a, in a row, but second half, some physical toughness started to emerge and I was no happy with that. Now I look at it and see the people think I'm crazy when I see say this, but to me, the emerging star on defense through eight games, because like I said, I can't watch this team play no more because this ain't Alabama uh this year. It's somebody else running around out there in crimson uniforms. I think Rutgers it, it switched places with Alabama, but um, I like the way Brian Branch has has played this year. Um, he, he shows the toughness that you know th- those other in the past defensive backs have showed. Um, even though you know he was projected not to even be a starter, but this guy brings that energy. Um, even if he makes a mistake, Steve. Football is football. You're going to make mistakes. Uh, um, you're going to blow coverages. But this dude seems like he does it full speed. If you're going to make a mistake, you make a mistake going full speed. Um, I believe everybody else out there, this whole team, nobody should enter the draft except for maybe Will Anderson on the defense and Brian Branch. Uh, uh, that's just my opinion. I, I think definitely – um, everybody else got something to work on, um, even though I would love to see some of them go just to get them out of there. Um, but I think those two, they got a, a a serious chance in the NFL. A lot of these other guys, these on that defensive side of the ball that was supposed to be the bright spot this year, they just really subpar to me. To me. Uh, nobody has really stood out, stood out. Dallas Turner, he still got some growing to do, but I think Brian Branch, and Will Anderson are, are, are definitely um, top two round draft picks, in my opinion. Uh, let me know how you feel about that, Steve. And thank you for taking my call, man. Appreciate Elijah from Jersey calling in there. I mean, I mean, I, like I said, second half against Ole Miss saw some signs of life there. 
in terms of toughness, taking that step forward. Uh, like, like I mentioned, would we, we, we much rather have seen this earlier in the season? Absolutely. We would have much rather have seen this week two, week three, week four, develop the type of identity on offense and defense for Alabama. But I guess it's like the old saying goes, better late than never, maybe, I guess. But we take this call here. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feeling? State your name and where you calling from? Steven, how's everything shaking down there in Birmingham on this manic Monday? How you doing? Well, I'm, I'm doing great, Wayne. I'm doing fantastic. You got Austin Pay uh, this weekend. You got Auburn next weekend for the Iron Bowl. But just happy that, you know, after the game against Ole Miss, and I was in there, you know, in the post game press conference, and Saban took the podium, and uh, you know, he mentioned how if a team took a step forward, especially with how they played in the second half against the Rebels. So, uh, can you take the second half against Ole Miss? and make it a full game against Austin Pay and Auburn. We'll see. But like the fight and the competitiveness that, that was shown uh, against Kiffin and company. Yeah, the second half was a, well, you know, quite a bit of turnaround there. I don't know what the Coach Saban had to say there, Bryce, but something, you know, fired up some people. But uh, I don't know Austin Pay will be the easy one. But Cadillac, he's got <laughs> Auburn rolling a little bit. I'm proud of him for what he's done. I'm glad they put him in that position down there at Auburn. He could be a dangerous coach. He's got a lot of people fired up on the sideline, a lot of players buying in. So I just hope some of the players on the team had not give up hope. Still play for that big AS on your shirt there, Alabama, and, and do the best you can. And, hey, it's not the end of the world. There's another season. If the good Lord's willing, we'll be here and, Alabama always be back. They always have and they always will. We got to keep it high hopes. I always say high hopes. But y'all looking good. Everybody be safe this week. Uh, get ready to enjoy Thanksgiving. We got some games coming up Saturday. Early game, I know. You don't want to get up too early, but eh, that's all right. You'll, it'll be good. I love all y'all. I'll catch y'all later on in the week. Steven, y'all be good. I'll talk to y'all later on. Bye-bye, everyone. Appreciate Wayne and the president calling in here on a Monday. And, um, uh, you know, Cadillac Williams is doing a, a good job over there at Auburn. I mean, will, will he be? I, I don't think they're going to hire him to be the full-time coach. If they do, tremendous because of what he's done, uh, you know, with that program and, and for him as a player and now him as an interim coach. But that will be fun to see what they do in terms of at the end of this season. But we grab this call here. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feeling? State your name and where you calling from. And this is Ray in Colorado. Hey, Ray, what's happening? Doing good. Just got off work, man. About to go get into something, you know, if you catch my drift, sir. But um, uh, I apologize if somebody already talked about this. If LSU drops a game and they're 8-3 and three or 9-3 and three or whatever, and Bama wins their two, is there a chance we go to the SEC championship? Over over LSU, no, there is not because LSU oh, beat, be, because LSU beat Arkansas. LSU's clinched; they're in. They are in. Oh, damn. Even if they lose two more games, they're still in. Even even if they lose two more games, they are still in. They clinched; <laughs> they're in. Okay, I'm glad you answered that because I was thinking now. I don't, now I don't have to have my mind on that anymore. They for clearing that up. Yeah, because I saw a post of the defense. I saw a post. I mean, if Brian Branch played as good as his physique looks, he's jacked. You know, and we built him. I remember when he when he first came. If he if he played, but I, but I saw it. I saw that secondary. But man, it just it just clicked a little bit too too late. I was thinking, you know, strength of schedule. The committee saw it. You know, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here. Not saying we deserve to be there, but. I, I'm thinking, you know, if we got in, we could mess some stuff up. You know, Elk, you know, you got Ohio State, Michigan, they'll settle their differences. TCU's probably going to win out. Clemson, Clemson with that trash schedule and struggle wins. We shouldn't even be talking about them. You know, but I, I would like to see TCU in there. I like to see a, a newcomer. You know, TCU hasn't been ranked in the top five since. Woo. Or Danny six, seven, and Thomas. <laughs> 
<laughs> you remember when I think it was like TCU? Remember like Arizona State was in the top ten? Oh my gosh, here. man! Oh my gosh! Do you remember that? Yes, <laughs> I remember that. It was like TCU, it was Arizona State. I think Arizona was in the top fifteen. It wasn't. I mean, it was different. It was different. I, I mean, I, I mean, when, 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 Ray, when, when you talk TCU, you think of like two players. You think of Ladanian Tomlinson, and then for goodness' sake, you think of Andy Dalton. <laughs> Andy Dalton. Oh. Of all people yep, that hit your I, mind, of all people that hit your mind, when you think that when you think the purple frog and Texas Christian University, Andy Dalton. I think we're gonna get a win in the SEC. I think uh, you know, just the. I think I think George is probably gonna go ahead and take it. I hate. To, I really hate to not see Bama there because we're we're one of those teams where if we could just get in that one year we uh won the championship. Remember we uh snuck in the playoffs. It was it was it was between us and Ohio State, if you remember. It was twenty it was twenty seventeen. It was twenty seventeen. Okay. Okay. It was twenty seventeen. We snuck in the playoffs. Everybody said we we shouldn't be there and all this stuff and, and we had Jalen Hurts, I think in his second year and everybody was like, oh, you're not going to beat Clemson if you get in. They should be here. And they had Kirk Herbstreet with the little committee thing, and everybody was saying all this stuff. And they gave Nick Saban. Nick Saban is the Dr. Doom of the college football world. Prep time. If you give this man prep time, even I was like, how are we going to beat Clemson? With, with Jalen Hurts, and he ain't passing the ball. He wasn't passing the ball to his third year right. And he and we went in there, and Deron Payne, I think it was Deron Payne, Deron Payne scored for us. <laughs> that was Deron Payne. I, I, the, the defense that game uh, went off against Clemson, and then we all saw what happened second half of the national championship. You yank Jalen Hurts, you go a double T in the morning to a Tonga Vangoa, and the rest is history. rest is history, yep. So, all right, all right, Steven, man, yeah, I was – I was, I was thinking, you know, because I, I feel, I feel LSU was going to lose the A and M. I think, Kurt, I, I think uh, uh, Jimbo Fisher, he's over there eating those Jimbo Jumbo Bar S Walmart hot dogs because they're going to they're going to come take that money out of the account because he robbed that state, man. That is terrible. So it could be worse. We could be A and M. You know. But yeah, I, I was thinking A and M was gonna win that game, and, I, and yeah, I'm putting, I'm saying it right now. A and M will beat LSU. I might go out and buy a jersey. Appreciate my man Ray from Colorado calling in, giving his thoughts here on the show. I know, I know a lot of people would love to see Bama in the SEC title game, and I would too. And a lot of people were pulling for Arkansas to get the win over LSU. It didn't happen. Tigers won by I believe three, so they're in the SEC championship game. Uh, Alabama looking at either New Year's Six Bowl or just a really good bowl game. We shall see. But we take this call. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feeling? State your name and where you calling from. Hey, Steven. It's Daniel from Phoenix City. Daniel, what's going on? Oh, not much, man. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I love that game over the weekend. You know, there was times I was a little, uh, a little tense on the edge of my seat. But, uh, you know, we got the W, and so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, I've, so I just called in. I haven't listened to anything except Waylon and the last caller. Um, so if I repeat anything, I apologize. But uh, the biggest question I've got of a couple is about Terry on Arnold. So do you think that there's a chance that he ends up moving back to safety? There, Daniel, is a good possibility, and that's a good thought and question to have because uh, as much as Nick Saban is trying to get him to play corner and he's had some good moments, yes, he, he still has some areas in his technique that he needs to clean up because there are times where Terion will allow a wide receiver to get inside of him, get the leverage, on plays and it kind of messes him up, but he's, he's had some good moments. But to me, he came out of high school in Tallahassee, Florida, as one of the best safety prospects. He's got range. He's got range. He's got coverage ability, can be a really 
good safety. And I feel like, Daniel, that will depend on uh, – how does Saban tinker with the secondary in the offseason? Because uh, you look at Brian Branch, does he go pro? You know, you're going to lose DeMarco Helms and Jordan Battle. And if you look at Eli Ricks, does he go? Does he choose to come back? So uh, there are going to be a lot of questions here upon the end of the season, especially in the secondary, in terms of players and their draft grades. But if, if, if a good bit of players go to the draft from that defensive backfield, there, there's a thought you could have Terry on Arnold at safety, and I think he could thrive there. And I, and I agree. I mean, I, I know that's his natural position. And, uh, you know, like you said, he's had some really good shining moments. Then he's also had those times throughout the year where, you know, he's just got toasted. And, you know, he's gotten better. I mean, you know, look at Kool-Aid last year. He had those moments, but Kool-Aid's also progressively gotten better and better and better, which I've loved seeing him, you know, where he's at. Because despite what people say about Kool-Aid, I think he's I think he's doing great. And we think he's good this year. Wait till next year and just the development he's going to have there. But the other, the other thing I was going to ask um, is, about, you know, next year as far as, you know, who's coming back and all that. I was – I think doesn't Harrell have another year of eligibility? Tyler Harrell does. So he, he left Louisville as a sophomore. So he's a junior this year. Harrell does have another year left. See, and I would, I would love to see that guy. And I know uh, Coach Saban said today, I think, that they were looking at uh, – you know, implementing them. And honestly, at this point, I would just wish they'd just stop talking about implementing folks and just do it. But, you know, I mean, I'm absolutely. not a coach, I mean, a- so. I mean, absolutely. Because if, if, if you're saying that this young man is healthy and we've seen all the tape of him from Louisville creating the separation with his speed, winning uh, at the snap of the ball on his routes, let's get this on the field. If he's, if he's as healthy as... As you're saying, he is, Coach Saban. Get this young man on the field, and let's really see this. Right. I mean, I, I know he's good. I, you know, I went back and watched some of his stuff, and, I mean, the guy looks phenomenal. And, I mean, I, I, would, I would just love to see him. You know, and, and, and honestly, I think he, he has to come back is what, what I would think in my mind just because, you know, this year he hasn't had, as, as far as I've seen, he's only had the one catch, and I could be wrong. I think that was a couple games ago when um, Jalen came in to clean up for Bryce. Right. But, he, he, um, he, yeah. He said, he, he said he's had the, he had the one catch there. He had the one catch there against Mississippi State. So he, he does not have the tape. He does not have the reps at Alabama to put on film uh, for NFL teams anyway. So he, he needs to come back. Right. And um, the other thing, uh, did you happen to watch uh, the the video with uh, Justin Riley and Coach Smook yesterday? I did not. That, that was the one video I did not catch. <laughs> you, I thought I, I loved it. And um, and I'll say I I love listening to Coach Smook because he just puts everything down at a level and breaks everything down really well. And and one thing he mentioned and. And I, I hope he's right on one of these points. But, uh, man, he said, you know, the, the writing's pretty much on the wall for uh, Bill O'Brien. And, God, I, I hope that's true, that, you know, this, after this, this is it. We, we just cut, we just sever that limb off. We're just done. But um, as far as Pete is concerned, he said, you know, he's got a kind of a, a suspicion that, Pete will be back next year. What What do you think on that? And then I'll leave you alone. It, it is it is the most eeriest of things, Daniel. But I think I think the band aid on Bill O'Brien will, will, will be ripped off. I think regardless of what happens, O'Brien's out of here. He's out of Tuscaloosa. Regardless of what happens, I, he will not be in Alabama after this season. When, I, when you look at Pete Golding. As much as you have the masses of Alabama fans saying he needs to be gone too, I feel like Coach Saban still looks at Pete's recruiting acumen 
And it's like, we can't afford to lose that. So, but even with that, do you move Pete off the field and just have him as a recruiter and go get you a proven defensive coordinator? That's what I would do. If you value Pete's recruiting prowess, which Saban does, I would move Pete to an off-field row and say, son, you can just be our ace recruiter, but we're moving you off the field. And I go get a bona fide D.C., bring that guy to Tuscaloosa. I don't know how Coach Saban's going to pull this, but that would be just what I would do. It makes sense. I mean, I, I like Pete. I do. It's just, you know, uh, maybe it's uh, an X's and O's thing. I don't know. It's just I, I want to see some of that uh, that toughness back. And, you know, with some of these guys coming in, you know, that we maybe even already have on the bench or some of these guys coming in next year, I, I, I feel like maybe it's just a gut feeling. I don't know that some of that dog mentality and that toughness, we might get some of that that back. And I, I hope I'm right on that. It's just I think those guys are going to be hungry and I hope I'm right, man. But anyways, I really appreciate you taking my call. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Daniel from Phoenix City calling into the show right here on a Monday. Eli, you talked about this when we were driving down to Oxford. You said you felt like the team was going to be hungry next year and you know, next year's the year. So Daniel took some right from Eli right there in the production studio. We take this call. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feel? And state your name and where you calling from. Hey, this is uh, Jody up in uh, Virginia, a longtime uh, Alabama fan, originally from Florence, Alabama, spent 24 years in the military and really appreciate your show, been able to watch it up here and uh, your perspective on everything and how you bring Alabama fans together. And uh, just want to say that uh, I was proud of the team and how they responded this week. Um, especially after the first quarter, um, you know, Bryce on the sideline, getting everybody fired up, a lot of emotion. Um, I was at the Tennessee game. I drove down to Knoxville. It's like an eight-hour drive from Virginia and uh, first Bama-Tennessee game I've ever been to. And that was one of the things that really stuck out to me was, you know, watching the Bama players on the field. I never once really saw any emotion. And I think on um, – on the game this past Saturday, you kind of saw that, especially in the second half. So proud of the team. And and one of the things that really – the players that really stuck out to me was uh, was Kendrick Law. It was nice to see him get some action. I don't know if uh, anybody talked about that earlier today, but I really was uh, nice to see him get some action. And I thought he did really well. I thought he uh, – Jody, I, I thought he did too. And uh, Kendrick Law – Coach Saban highlighted him today and, and, and highlighted him also after the game Saturday in which he said that, you know, Bama, has, Bama had been trying to get Law into the rotation earlier this season and a lot earlier this season. But what happened, Law dealt with a torn hamstring. And so he's just now gotten himself back healthy and back in the flow of things has regained uh, the quickness there from the injury he played multiple positions in high school in Louisiana so the guy can ball the guy can flat out play he had three catches for 26 yards one of those going for a first down so I, I think to me you know if I was Alabama I, I would replace Trayshawn Holden or Jermaine Burton with Kendrick Law in a heartbeat because the guy he, he wants it he, he's a dog he's a competitor he desires to be out there uh, a young guy making plays. So very impressed with Kendrick Law, not just as a receiver, but on special teams. And he's not afraid to put his hands on somebody and block somebody. That, that, that's toughness right there. Oh, yeah. I was very uh, impressed about his, you know, aggressiveness. And, like, just he was really provided a nice little spark um, for the team, I thought. Another thing people were talking about with Tyler Harrell, do you know if he – did he redshirt at Louisville? Has he already used his redshirt season? I don't think so. He he he, more, he probably has. I don't think so. That's definitely something that I will fact check, but I don't think he's used it. Uh, I know when he came into Tuscaloosa, he was classified as a junior, so he does have another year left. 
And I think he should use that final year because uh, he does not have the game tape. He does not have the reps. He does not have the product on the field uh, uh, in terms of Alabama is concerned for NFL scouts to look at. So I think he needs to take advantage of his final season in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, I agree. Uh, last thing is one thing that kind of excites me of that could remain for the uh, rest of the season. Obviously can't overlook Auburn with uh, everything that, you know, Cadillac's got them rolling down there is the possibility of us playing Clemson in the orange bowl. Cause I know we're kind of like, uh, I think our records kind of like three and three or four and four. We may have an opportunity to kind of take the advantage in our little rivalry you had going with them. So, that's kind of something I'm kind of looking forward to. Hopefully we get to play play them, and hopefully the whole team don't set out the bowl game. And if they all play, I think we would beat the crap out of them. But I really appreciate you taking my call, Steve. Appreciate Jody from Virginia calling in. That's a good thought. If Alabama plays Clemson in the Orange Bowl, right, you get the return of that little – Rivalry between Dabo, Sweeney, and Nick Saban. I mean, Eli, you remember how a whole bunch of Bama fans were going, you know, when Nick Saban retires, give us Dabo. We'll take Dabo Sweeney when Saban retires. Give us Dabo. Now, people have backed off that statement since then, but it'll also bring full circle. Bryce Young and DJ Uyangalele came in the same class. And there was a lot of conversation about DJ, better than Bryce, bigger than Bryce, stronger than Bryce, better arm. So many people had Uyangalele higher than Bryce Young, and we've now seen that that's not the case. So if Alabama was to take on Clemson in the Orange Bowl, I got to be a ticket if that would happen right there. But we're going to take this call. You're live on the show. What's happening? How are you feeling? State your name and where you calling from. Hey, Steve. This is John from Connecticut. How's it going tonight? Doing great, man, to yourself. Good. Uh, yeah, I was going over what you were touching before about the coordinators. I think, uh, like you said, I think uh, Bill O'Brien probably won't be back next year. I can, I can see him taking a job somewhere else, maybe professional, go back to. I think he's more of a pro coordinator than a college. I would say. Um, but I think I think if Bama was smart, they would try to go out and get Garrett Riley as their new coordinator, and. Just give him a blank check. I, I, I've seen what he's done, and it's been great. I don't know if I mean, you think what, about that. What, what, what Garrett Riley has done at TCU has been remarkable. I mean, a, a young, innovative offensive mind. I mean, he's got that offense flying on all cylinders. And, and the fact that, you know, you, you've got the genetics when you have uh, – he's the younger brother of Lincoln Riley. We all know Lincoln Riley, probably outside of Steve Sarkeesian – the best offensive mind in college football outside of Sarkeesian and maybe Kiffin put him put him second would be Lincoln Riley. So to have to have Garrett Riley at Alabama, if the Crimson Tide can pull that car and woo him away from TCU, I'd do it. Yeah, I mean maybe like you were saying, maybe you don't want to get rid of Pete Golden because of his recruiting. Maybe move him to just recruiting and try to get maybe Jeremy Pruitt back. I mean, I miss the days when he was there, the 16th season, 17th season. I mean, just Bamo just turn, getting turnovers and, and, and bring it to the end zone. I was like, those are great. I mean, I miss that uh, 16th season. That was probably one of my favorite defenses that Bama's ever had. I was upset they didn't finish it that year, but it was still, still a great defense. It, 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 it was an entertaining defense to watch, John. But the, th- the thing with Pruitt, he was fired with calls from Tennessee – the NCAA, I don't know when they're going to actually start the investigation from that. Maybe soon, but I mean, he, he, was fired, he was fired with calls from Tennessee. But I also feel like this, with how, with how inconsistent and uh, just up in smoke the SEC officiating has been this year, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if Coach Saban calls the SEC front office and is like, hey, with all the with all with all the turmoil y'all put us through with y'all officiating, we're just gonna call Jeremy Pruitt and bring him back to Tuscaloosa, and y'all just gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> just, just give us a wash for all the for all the horrible. I still can't get over that defensive pass interference in, in Tennessee. Um, the one where Kool Aid got the entry. I mean, the, the dude was seventy thought, yards was, the I other way. Was, 
Yeah. They that stands and they, I I don't I don't, I believe at first they were going to call a block in the back, which would have still been fine. But then all of a sudden the ref on the other side of the field says, "No, I was passing." Her. I I just don't understand it. And then in that same drive earlier in that drive, Tennessee fumbled, but then they called a stop. They called an early whistle, which he clearly fumbled. It wasn't for progress. John, there were so many calls from that game that still make me scratch my head. And I know you don't blame the officials. You don't put yourself in that situation. But there were so many calls from that game. And me personally, the most blatant one, uh, you know, Bryce Young took a shot in the chops there. And, uh, you know, there's no targeting. There's no 15-yard rough in the passer. Uh, I, I, I don't get it. Nick Saban didn't get it. But can't cry over the spilled milk. It's already there. But, uh, yeah way yeah but i i don't know i mean i think bama's a couple of plays away from being undefeated and they're also a couple of plays away from being have four losses so it can go either way it can it can go either way appreciate john from connecticut there for that call right there showing love to the show we're touching all ends of the globe people we're getting calls from Nigeria. We're getting calls from Connecticut. We're, we're, we're touching all parts of the globe here. We'll take this call. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feeling? State your name and where you calling from. Hey, Steven. This is Cici. How's it going? We got the best analyst caller right here. Cici, what's happening? Hey. <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm doing well. I mean, good, good win there. We saw some toughness about time. Second half against Ole Miss, so I'm, I'm I'm doing okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I wanted. So you know, I'm gonna break it down. If I'm gonna call, I'm gonna break it down. So I I'm gonna start with this. I and and they're gonna have to correct my name. My it's spelled C apostrophe C H I. Um, but I checked our website and I saw that Bill and Pete were still employed. Now I was a little confused. <laughs> And I was wondering, like, okay, well, I guess they're not getting the message, you know, whatever. Um, but I will say that our performance against Ole Miss, um, we we looked more physical. Um, we looked like we were just playing more as a unit on both sides of the ball. Um, so that was something that, to me, that stood out. I will say, like, the first few, uh, maybe the first quarter really um, kind of, you know, was a little shaky. But what I've noticed is a pattern with O'Brien and his play calling. Like, it seems like the first three quarters, it's like we're playing, like, patty cake or something with the ball with these, you know, conservative lack of creativity plays. And then we try to make up for it in the fourth quarter. And you, how, how are you – how are you the best if you're always playing from behind? That doesn't work for teams like Tennessee or, you know, the Auburn's the Ole Miss, where for a lot of these teams, playing us is like playing a national championship game. So to me, I personally don't see O'Brien going to any other team, whether it's in the NFL or another college. I just don't see how that would work. Um, but I did want to say um, – you know, I was very impressed with uh, Kendrick Law, but I'm still wondering where is Tyler Harrell. I mean, you, you talk about how he executed at Louisville, and I understand that's a different conference, and so they're playing different caliber, you know, teams. But at the same time, to me, he's still our X factor. I don't think Christian Leary was on the field, um, at least from what I remember, when we played Ole Miss, or if he was, he didn't have any carries, and I'm kind of confused with that. You know, I would have liked to have seen Aaron Anderson, um, Henderson, Shaz Press, and even though they're freshmen, I still feel like a lot of times those true freshmen, they're hungry. I mean, it makes me think about the Devontae Smiths, right? I mean, I, I just I, I don't understand. To me, it goes beyond just calling plays. You need to know who to put in the game and when. And I just feel like O'Brien is still – he's just still confused. And I think in terms of our running game, I still have not seen Jamarian Miller, you know, in the past few games. And if I remember correctly, he averages about like seven or eight yards per carry. So it just doesn't make sense why we're not creating plays that incorporate Jamarian Miller more. You know, where is Trey Sanders? Like I, I think we saw him early in the season, but we haven't seen him since. You know, uh, I'm thinking about like the the tight ends, like lots of he's been good. You know, he was good last year, so we shouldn't be surprised. But I'm trying to figure out where it's in the black, Amari in the black. You know, I remember he balled out earlier this season. So it just seems to me like we have the weapons. But when you think about the, the full full kit, you know, it's not just the players. You know, you, you think about the coaching and just the play calling, the lack of trust that the players would have with the coaches because they just don't feel 
if I were them, I wouldn't feel confident. I would feel like, okay, here we have the best quarterback in the nation. We're going to have to rely on him to basically overcompensate for, for O'Brien, you know, and it's, it's sad to see that. But I will say this. I'm going to try to make it quick. Um, I know that this is going to be kind of like an, I don't know, like unpopular opinion or a lot of people may not necessarily agree, but I'm going to say it. I do think that we still have a shot at the playoffs. No, hear me out. <laughs> so I know that we're out of the SEC championship, and, and that, that may be to our benefit, but I do still think we have a shot. So I, I think that, you know, LSU has a good chance of losing to Texas A&M. Now, that may not affect them, of course, going to the SEC championship game, but that'll be their third loss, and I think their chances of even, you know, possibly making it into the top four would be out, right? Um, I still think that, you know, Georgia, I think they're going to beat LSU. Um, of course, that'll be – possibly their third or fourth loss if they don't lose to Texas A&M. But I still think that even USC, for example, they still have UCLA, Notre Dame. So they're going to lose one of those games. And I think that'll be like their second, possibly third loss. It's going to look worse than our, and then our two losses. So I still see us, you know, moving up if we continue to not just win, but we need to dominate. Um, I still think that TCU, I think this weekend, you know, they I think they play at Baylor. They have a good sh- a good chance at losing. I thought they would have lost to Texas, but they, you know, somehow pulled through. And then, you know, considering like the Michigan's Ohio State, they still have to play each other. But I believe Michigan still has um, Illinois at Illinois. And so, you know, you never know what might happen. So I still think that there are, um, you know, just there are areas where we can still hang hang some hope. Um, I, I don't think it's completely over. Um, and I know that you mentioned uh, Pruitt. And I did want to mention that because I, I think that it's gotten quiet in that regard. Um, If I remember correctly, I I know that uh, Pruitt was fired in January of last year. And I believe that, you know, the the violations that had happened, it wasn't just him, it was some of the uh, assistants and all that. And if I remember correctly, they said that it happened over a span of three years. Now, to me, that sounds like that would have been over the course of some of the players who were still there, that they were there at that time. So I'm still trying to figure out um, just with how the NCAA is going to, you know, what they're going to do in regards to this. But I do think that given that 90-day period that was given to Tennessee a few months ago, it almost seems like everything is kind of coming towards the end of the season where there is a possibility that they could be disqualified. I'm not going to hang my hat on that, but I do think that that's something that a lot of people have kind of gotten quiet about because they saw Tennessee beat Alabama. And so they kind of swept that under the rug. But when I looked at how, um, you know, Josh Eiffel, however he, he pronounced his last name, when I saw, when I watched his interviews, you know, it to me, it almost seems like there is, you know, someone who may try to like hold back their excitement a little bit, like almost like he knows that there's a possibility that there could be something that happens towards the end of the season that could possibly disqualify them. And so I I don't think that that's necessarily off the table when you look at the extent of the violations that were committed um, at Tennessee when he was there, but also I think their um, defensive coordinators, some of the players that are still there, it makes me wonder because I did see that some of them weren't even, they shouldn't have even played. So it's just, it's a lot of um you know gray areas there and I think that we could see something happen in that regard so just you know regarding the teams that are are ahead of us right now in my opinion anything can happen and like I said the last time I called in um Cadillac Williams being at Auburn of course that's going to give them some form of an edge but we just have to do what we know that works Um, I think that we still have a lot of players that need to touch that field that we can rely on but um anyway i know i said a lot so what are your what are your thoughts on that i i like where you're going with this cc in terms of the playoff i, I like where you're going with this because i i personally remember 2011 pre-college football playoff where alabama had lost to lsu nine to six and uh, about six or seven teams lost the very next week i remember that year where oregon had lost Stanford had lost, USC had lost, Boise State had lost, several other teams had lost, and then Bama found itself right there in the national championship game to rematch against LSU, and we all saw it happen there. So anything could happen. I know it's a whole bunch of scenarios, there's a whole bunch of numbers that have to be calculated, but it definitely can happen. And the one thing that Saban is, is the master of is keeping guys focused on one thing. I know in a a mixture of scenarios, keep your vision on one thing. 
and if, say if anybody else can do if, if anybody can do this better better than anybody else can. Saban is the one guy that will keep these guys lazed on one thing, but I definitely like the playoff scenario, CC, that you got there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's just, to me, I see what it is. I don't, I have no problem with giving, you know, kudos to the other teams because I like how they're progressively getting better. I think that the, I don't want to call them a cancer, but that, that, that factor that really prohibits us from really being who we truly are is O'Brien. You know, Golden, we do want to keep him just for recruiting purposes, but I think, you know, the, the time is up. And I don't know what else needs to be said or done, but at this point, it just seems like the, the players are out there on their own. And yeah, we have some good assistance, uh, you know, and all that. But I think at this point, if they want, if they want to win, if they want to, you know, see where things go, they're going to have to carry this, you know, themselves. It ain't going to be the coaches besides Coach Saban. So, um, yeah. But thanks for taking my call in real time. Absolutely appreciate C. She calling in right there from Atlanta. I said this before, you know. I think regardless of what happens to end this season, O'Brien's out of Tuscaloosa. I think that band-aid is ripped off. Pete Golding, it's a sticky situation with him. Because as much as you want to see him gone too, due to the steady decline of Alabama's defense under his tutelage, uh, Saban loves to get the athletes into Tuscaloosa by the way of recruiting. Pete Golding, one of the best recruiters on the staff. That's why I'm saying if you want to hold on to that, you would put him in an off-field role, take him off the field, and just let him recruit, and then bring in a defensive coordinator that's a proven guy, check his numbers, check his history, check his records, bring a guy in here that he knows what he's doing with a Lamborghini and not trying to crash the car. So you get a guy here that knows what they're doing, in terms of running a defensive program here. But we take this call. You're live on the show. What's happening? How we feeling? State your name. And where are you calling from? Stephen M. Brian from Richmond, Virginia. How you doing, buddy? Doing great. And yourself, man? Good, good. So good win down in Oxford. I've been listening to a bunch of callers in with Pete and Bill. You know, one of the dishear- good and bad things you saw this weekend was you know, we've talked about it all season where the players just don't seem to have that energy. It was great to see our leader, Bryce, fire up some guys on the sideline, but you got to be kidding me that we got to have Bryce getting people fired up to get their heads back in their game. And he's not, and, 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 he, and, and the thing is, the thing, the thing is, Brian, he's not one known to speak. Absolutely not. And if you were reading his lips on the headset, I was ho- I was hoping he was talking to Bill and basically telling him to shut up because, quite frankly, that's a leader that we love to see. But you're right. That's not Bryce. That's not his personality. But you clearly saw the frustration. You clearly saw where he needed something else out of everybody. Glad to see everybody stepped up. But, man, it's just a little disheartening that at this point in the season and a game like that, you're, you're not already amped up yourself. You're not ready to go. You're not ready to, you know, kind of run through everybody and to make it happen yourself. Someone's got to get in your face and call you out. You know, there's something else here, and I've been pretty vocal on the, as we all have, on Bill and Pete and whomever else. And, you know, as you saw, it was good to see C7 come out, have a good game. Good to see Byron Young come out, do what he did. Certainly we want to see more players. I, I would hope this weekend against Austin P. Um, in terms of getting some guys that just haven't gotten field time out there. But as you saw, I think overall, another set of struggles, the wide receivers in general. And even though I've been kind of hawking on Bill and Pete, where's, in your opinion, where's Holman Wiggins in this equation? Because part of it's got to be also on him in terms of where we are at this point in the season with our wide receiving core where we are in terms of still critical drop passes, not having a set unit out there, and really just trying to still find ourselves. So I'm curious to hear from you what your thoughts are on, on Holman Wiggins and you know where is he kind of lining up in this entire coordinator's equation because some of it's got to rest on that guy's shoulder as well as far as I'm concerned. 
I mean, Brian, absolutely. Coach Wig plays a role in this as the wide receivers coach, not just that, as the only offensive holdover assistant coach from the 2019 season. So Coach Wig knows his entire offense backwards, forward, sideways. Uh, he's the assistant head coach of the offense. So uh, some of this does fall on him, especially when you look at you know, he's done well with guys like Judy and Ruggs and Smith and Walter, but those are just transcendent talents. He did well with John Mechie and Jamison Williams, but Jamison Williams, another one of those transcendent talents. So you look at the guys that Alabama has here, you know, where is the development of these receivers? When you look at a, a Ja'Cory Brooks, a Christian Leary, a, uh, a JoJo Earl, uh, a, the, the, the more development of a Trayshawn Holden, a Jermaine Burton, like where is that development? So a lot of this, some of this does go on Coach Wiggins. It's on the players, but coaches are there for a reason. It's their job to get the most out of them. You mentioned – just with it right there, some talent that just transcends the game. It's your job as a coach to get all you can out of some of the folks that don't have the talent of a Judy, Devontae Smith, some of these others, Waddle. I just don't see it happening. We got a lot of work to do in the offseason. Obviously, everybody is still hoping and praying. We're still in the playoff picture. Uh, you know, being a Bama fan, we don't deserve it. I think we kind of run through the rest of the season the best we can. We do it for pride. We get to the off season. Nick makes a lot of changes. We get some good coaches in here. We tune up the talent where we need to tune it up. And we come back like we did after that 20, uh, during the 2020 season where we went to the bowl game and played a Michigan team that didn't really matter, came back, pissed off, focused, and ran through everybody. That's what I'm hoping for and what I'm hoping to see. Quite frankly, I'm hoping everybody is uh, kind of on the same page to do that. Stephen M., love the show as always. We'll talk to you soon. All the best. Absolutely. Brian calling in from Virginia. And, uh, Eli, before I make my thought here, I want to give a shout-out to the state of Virginia. Having a lot of people calling in from Virginia, and even though, you know, I spent – you know, some, 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 I spent a couple of years of my young life in Jacksonville, Florida. Grew up wholeheartedly, Perry County, Marion, Alabama. Went to college at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. Currently, now live in Tuscaloosa. But I was born in Norfolk, Virginia. I was born right there. Father in the military, in the Navy. So, shout out to my birth state. It's been calling in on this show. Going some love there to Virginia. We're going to a cool, cool call topic here, Eli, and that's on Saban updating the media on Eli Ricks and Jameer Gibbs. Both of those two sustained small little injuries there against Ole Miss. Eli Ricks had a little head thing that happened with him. I think they got him in concussion protocol, if I'm not mistaken, but Ricks did. You know, according to Saban, he saw him in the locker room. He saw him before leaving Oxford. Ricks was doing okay, responding well. Should be fine and prepared to go for this week. We should definitely hear more from Saban on Ricks during his press on Wednesday. Jameer Gibbs had a twisted ankle against the Rebels. According to Coach Saban, I think Jameer seems to be okay. He seems to be fine. So, like I said, Wednesday... Saban's final presser before the Austin P game uh, will get final word on Ricks and Gibbs, but the two initially from Coach Saban appearing to be fine uh, coming off of the game against Ole Miss. But we go to our final break here, folks. We'll touch that down. When we get back, we tidy up loose ends, wrap things up with young players, fresh names that need these reps against Austin P to boost up, jumpstart their confidence in the next season. We'll talk those players after this.
Touchdown Alabama Magazine is Alabama football's premier publication. A subscription to Touchdown Alabama Magazine is the perfect gift for any Alabama fan. For exclusive news and information, recruiting updates, a free annual print magazine, and more, go to touchdownalabama.com and click join. Only $7.95 per month or pay $74.95 for a full year subscription. That's a yearly saving of $20. Go to touchdownalabama.com today and roll tide. Thank you for tuning in. Show your support right now by clicking that like button. If you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button now and enable all notifications to make sure you don't ever miss any of the best Alabama football news, notes, and information right here on Touchdown Alabama. All right, people, we're back into the action from the break. Rocking and rolling here on the show on the streets. Talking Bama. Football news, in my own words, yours truly, Stephen Smith of TDA. On a Monday, got the man Ian Out Walker in the production studio. 95 likes on the show, we're five away from 100. Five away from 100 likes. Hit that like button, hit that thumbs up. Give us a like on the show. Appreciate the support there from you. All donations welcome, all donations appreciate it. That daily super chat go $100. Daily super chat go $100 right there. Appreciate you, the fans, for all that you do. Making this your spot here to talk Bama football. Also, tune in tomorrow, 6 p.m. Central Time. Streaming here on the TDA YouTube channel. We got the Bama Standard with Justin Riley, comedy legend Steve Brown, all SEC linebacker, Bama legend Marvin Constant. USFL champion, two-time national championship running back, Bo Scarborough. Yours truly, Stephen M. Smith, the Bama Standard on tomorrow. Got two incredible guests. We got O.J. Howard, former national championship tight end, and uh, George Teague, 1992 national champion. Join us here on the Bama Standard. So you want the legends, you want the fun, you want the excitement? Put in tomorrow, 6 p.m. Central Time, right here, TDA YouTube channel, streaming the Bama Standard. Also, don't forget about TDAWare.com. That's TDAWare.com. So, I know we got two games left in the regular season. Where has the time gone? But still, get that gear. Rep your team and the brand. Giving you the information on your team. All the swagger, sauce, drip, clothing, cultural, fashion needs, TDAWare.com. Make sure stop shop, number one place for your gear. TDAWear.com, link in the description. Show that support for Coach Saban, University of Alabama, the student athletes, and us here. Touchdown Alabama Magazine. But, Eli, one thing I enjoy about non-conference games, and no, I'm not referring to getting up at 11 o'clock a.m., but the one thing I do enjoy about non-conference games is uh, the young players they get a chance to build their confidence and uh, jumpstart kind of their Alabama careers into uh, the next season or the new season. And for Alabama, I guess Austin P this weekend, this is the perfect time for some fresh faces to get some reps, get some continuity within the system, and springboard themselves into – the spring of next year. And uh, starting this off here with some some offensive guys, my first thought here is the quarterback situation between uh, Ty Simpson and Jalen Milrow. I mean, uh, if I'm Coach Say, but I, I start the quarterback com, com, uh, conversation for next spring against Austin P. Like, I have Bryce Young, maybe, but I have Bryce Young out there for maybe a quarter. Give him a quarter. Second quarter throughout the rest of the game, let it be Jalen Milrow, Ty Simpson. Let these two young brothers get working. And let's see, heading into spring of next year, who's the guy for the job that can get Bama back to a national championship? We know Jalen Milrow is one heck of an athlete, one unbelievable talented athlete. He's got the footwork, the athleticism, the legs. He can run. He's got speed like that. He's made some improvements in the passing game. Needs to do more, though. And then you have Ty Simpson, who's got wiggle, too. Great feet, deceptive feet. Boy, does he have an arm, though. 
accurate, precision, arm strength, working with quarterback country, same group that spent time with A.J. McCarron, Jacob Coker, Mac Jones. This is going to be a fun situation right here. If I'm, if I'm Nick Saban, give Bryce Young one quarter against Austin P. The rest of the game, Ty Simpson, Jalen Milrow. Let's see what is this future after Bryce Young springboard us into spring ball. But that would be the first thing I would look at. Next thing I would look at is uh, getting these young receivers out here. I mean, it's time. Getting these young receivers. We've seen Kobe Prentice this season. We've seen Isaiah Bond. But now, Shaz Preston. Get him out there. Kendrick Law. Get him out there more. Aaron Anderson. Get him out there. It's it's time. These young receivers. Hungry, tough, dog mentality. They want to be out there. It's just time for these freshman receivers to get reps. Get them ready for spring of next year. Get them ready for the 2023 college football season. Get them going. Get them going. Saban already mentioned he wanted to have Kendrick Law be more in the flow this season. Perfect timing, Coach Saban. Get him in the flow against Austin P. Get Aaron Anderson in the flow against Austin P. Get Shaz Preston in the flow against Austin P. I mean, we, we, you got nothing to lose here. It ain't like Jermaine Burton going to magically catch tw- 10 passes against Austin P. I I mean, g- g- get these young cats in here. Get these young cats in here and let these young Lions go to war. Springboard them into next season. Along with that, I mean, running back Jamarian, uh, Jamarian Miller, I want to see him get more opportunities against Austin P. I I mean, Jamarian Miller, early in the season, that young man was running. I mean, pinballing off guys. Had that Josh Jacobs type style almost. Keep in mind, when he left high school, Tyler Legacy High School in Tyler, Texas, over 5,000 rushing yards across four years. Kick and flat ball. Let out play. Running over guys. Knocking guys over. Get more reps here for Jamarian Miller. Built low, contact balance. Got to get him more out there in the field. Absolutely. Along with Jamarian Miller, I mean, Amari Nyblack. Time to use him more at that tight end position. Cameron Latu will be gone after the season. You got Nyblack at 6'3", 6'4", 230 pounds plus. I know Alabama's trying to get him to be a full package tight end. Wanting him to become a better blocker. I understand that. But at the same time, the guy's a freak pass catcher. Caught a touchdown pass earlier this season. Use all the talent that you got. Nye Black, this is a perfect game to have him on the field. Get these reps in here. Now, as we flip on over here to defense, uh, there's several names defensively that, 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 that got to have these reps. I mean, off the rip. Deontay Lawson, get him ready. Be a middle linebacker, starting middle linebacker next. I mean, the way this guy shoots gaps, knifes his way, fires through, dissects plays, plays well in coverage. Get Lawson out there. Kendrick Blackshire, time. Get the Avenger looking guy out there. Guy eats fried chicken and protein powder. Get, 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 get Kendrick Law out there. Get, get him out there. Put him on the field. Time to get Damon Payne. Defensive line out there more. Get him some more reps in there. Guys like Giad Campbell, Jeremiah Alexander. Get them guys out there. Any reps? Get, get, get them guys out there. Christian Story at the safety position. Going to lose Jordan Battle and DeMarco Helms to the NFL draft anyway. Get Christian Story in there. Get him some burn. Devontae Smith, defensive back. Get him some burn. Get him out there. Earl Little Jr.'s back healthy. Get him some burn. That young man out there. 
several young guys defensively that need to see the field against Austin P and jumpstarting them for the 2023 season. Just saying. This is the perfect matchup right here. Get some young talent out there. And I know Nick Saban's wanted to say, well, how you know the young guys are going to play? All right? How you know they're going to play? Coach Saban, they can only get better if they play. Can't get better to ride in the bench. Can't get better, you know, watching the sideline. I mean, practice can only do so much. Some guys in the let them guys see some 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 live bullets fly. That's how you get better. That's like that's like me, you know. You can't get your driver's license just, just sitting there watching the driver. You gotta get behind the wheel. You gotta get behind the wheel sometimes. We'll see how they play it. I think these young guys definitely gonna need some reps here against Austin P and moving forward. But as always, Bama Nation, you want the best in news, notes, information, coverage, entertainment. Your favorite program, that being the Crimson Tide. You can check this out by accessing the Touchdown Alabama Magazine app. You download the app from the iPhone App Store if you're rocking Team Apple. Google Play Store if you got the Android phone. For your audio needs, check us out. iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn Radio, Overcast.fm, or iHeartRadio. We got you covered. The good and gracious Lord sees fit. I'll be back on Wednesday, continuing the conversation that is Bama football. As always, folks, if you are try- if you're, you can get individual copies of Touchdown Alabama Magazine, you can get these sent to your door. That link will be found in the description. If you're trying to get the fresh edition, print edition of TDA the magazine, you go to touchdownalabama.com, click join, become a member or a subscriber today. That link in the description as well. Gotta shout out you guys, the outstanding fans of Bama football. All the donations, likes, super chats, calls, conversations, dialogue. You guys doing what you do. Make this your show, network, platform, channel, space to talk Bama. Appreciate my man Eli Walker in the production studio. Handling business with us here on a Monday. As always, you got to check out the Bama Standard tomorrow, 6 p.m. Central Time, streaming right here on TDA's YouTube channel with Justin Riley, comedy legend Steve Brown, all SEC linebacker, Bama legend Marvin Constant, USFL champion, two-time national championship running back Bo Scarborough, yours truly, Stephen M. Smith. We're going to have O.J. Howard, national championship tied in for Alabama, and... uh, George Teague, 1992, national champion. Safety for your Crimson Tide. Join us here on the show. You don't want to miss it. The Bama Standard tomorrow, 6 p.m. Central Time, right here on the TDA YouTube channel. But until next time, folks, husbands, love your wives. Wives appreciate, value those husbands, children. You guys continue doing the right thing, fun thing, smart thing, good thing, legitimate thing to not be bored there and get that homework done, school week right there. You get you those three hearty meals a day, those three great laughs a day. You protect yourself. You protect the loved ones around you. Until next time, folks, I'm your man, Stephen M. Smith, and you've been listening to my own words.